my goal is to show you the relationship between photosynthesis and show you the relationship between cellular respiration and how these two are interconnected. And I think by the time that I'm finished talking about these, that you will see a beautiful and a wonderful design, how that the outputs of one feed into the other and how that the outputs of one feed back into the other. It's kind of a circle of life. And so I'm gonna start out talking about the chloroplast, which is where photosynthesis takes place. This is usually in the leaves of a cell. Photosynthesis is what I wanna talk about first. And what is incredibly important is sunlight. Sunlight is incredibly important to this whole process. Inside of the chloroplasts are stacks of thylakoid discs. And it's kind of hard to see them here in the green. We'll give a little bit of blue. A lot of plants have a little bit of that color as well. And what happens is radiant energy from the sun shines down on these stacks of grana and it causes electrons inside of these stacks to be excited to a higher energy level. And then as these move back down to a lower energy level, there is energy released. And what, it, what happens is ATP is catalyzed. And the thing that, that you know about that you've seen as you're growing up is some of you have had these glow-in-the-dark stars on your ceiling. You put those up there, you, or you played with a glow-in-the-dark frisbee. And what happens is when it's night, they'll glow pretty bright for a while. And what is happening in those glow-in-the-dark things is that electrons are excited as they fall back down to a lower energy level. You have photons of light that are emitted. So this is kind of the same way. It's just that in this sense, you're not getting photons of light emitted, you're getting energy molecules, in this case, ATP. Now, another thing that's very important, you can have sunlight, but what else do you have to have, class? You have to have rain or you have to have water. So the beautiful thing is that water is broken down to form oxygen. And that's a beautiful thing because we breathe oxygen. Notice that this is a one to two ratio. So if we get a molecule of oxygen two, what would be the ratio that we would get? How many hydrogens would we get here? If we had two molecules of oxygen here and two here, then two times two makes what? Four. We would have four hydrogens. Now, why are these hydrogens important? The reason they're important is because in this step right here, the way that the chloroplast gets energy out of here is it pumps hydrogens across a membrane and then they become so numerous and so populated, so concentrated, that they will come back down through a protein channel called an ATPase. And that is how ATP is formed, by pumping hydrogen ions. And you're going to see in a minute whenever I do cellular respiration how that these same, same hydrogen ions just kind of get passed even from plants over to animals and how that they're used in animals to catalyze energy production. There is another stack of, actually, I shouldn't say another stack as if there are only two, but this one is called Photosystem 2 and this one is called Photosystem 1 and there is another process, maybe that's how I should say it, in which the electrons once again get excited. This time when they go back down to a lower energy state, they produce something called NADPH. Now, this is a B vitamin in plants that plants use, uh, they make energy with it. It's an energy carrying molecule. In humans, it's, not, it's the niacin vitamin. It's a B vitamin by the name of niacin. It just has an extra phosphate group on it in plants. All of this is called the light dependent reaction because it requires sunlight to energize the electrons. Now, we're gonna talk about the light independent reaction. It doesn't mean necessarily that the Kelvin cycle happens at night. Here's the 
Calvin cycle. It doesn't necessarily mean that it happens at night as much as it, this, this process it does not require darkness. It just can happen anytime. Well, plants also t take CO2 from animals, us, or from wood burning. Any kind of combustion reaction usually produces CO2. Plants take CO2 and the NADPH that you see and the ATP that you see and make fragments called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And there are two of these made for every turn of the cycle. Now, what I've learned through my research though is these each have three carbons each, but five out of six of these carbons have to be used to regenerate an intermediate chemical so that for every turn of the cycle, you only get one usable carbon. And so it actually takes six turns of this cycle to generate what you and I would recognize as what? What is this chemical compound? C6H12O6 is what? It's sugar or glucose. Now, the other interesting thing is that plants can make cellulose. Cellulose is the science word for what? It's wood, okay, marvelous. Plants can also make fat, and they can also make proteins. Now, as I've said before, my favorite fat from a plant, I think, the other day I was at the house, got an avocado, chopped some onions, chopped a tomato, little little jalapeno action, <laughs> a little bit of sour cream, put that, mashed that all together, got me a bowl of chips. What did I have? Guacamole. Guacamole. It's like one. It's that is mega fat right there wonderful mouthfeel. That's one of the reasons why we love it so much. It has a nice smooth mouthfeel to it. Probably the most common protein source from plants that you would recognize would be soy. Something like tofu or tempeh or something like that. That would be how you would, and, and so you can see that plants don't just produce this. This is what I'm concerned about today because this is the molecule that we're going to track through the next process. So. The next process that I want to link photosynthesis to is called cellular respiration. And this is what happens in your cells. I'm going to draw a really big cell. I always love to do that. And I'm going to draw a nucleus, even though that's not really what I'm talking about so much in this in this picture, but I'm going to draw that anyway. What happens in animals is that we bring glucose into our cells. And we can't really take this for granted because some people have a difficult time doing this. They don't have insulin. And insulin is important to bring this glucose inside of the cell. It may not be that the person doesn't have insulin. It may be that there's not enough. It may be that the receptor sites on the cell membrane are not receptoring it like they ought to. There's insulin is kind of complex. Uh, excuse me, diabetes is kind of complex. That's what I meant to say. But what the, the chief event that happens when we begin to break down glucose to make ATP is we've got to bring it into the cell. That's, that's an important step. Glucose is a six carbon molecule. So, what happens in the first step called glycolysis, glyco means sugar and lysis means to break down, is that this is cleaved right down the middle like this. And there are two three carbon molecules that are formed here. And these are called pyruvates. Now, in this step, there are about four ATPs generated, and in a minute I'm going to talk to you about a cost that is associated. 
but let's draw in a big player of this whole thing, and that is a mitochondrion. So I'm going to draw a mitochondrion here next, and that is where our story will continue. These little infoldings are called cristae inside of the mitochondrion. Well, what happens, class, is that these three carbon fragments get pulled into the mitochondrion and they have carbon dioxide cleaved off of them. There's one carbon going off of that one, so if we, if we had through three and we took one away, how many would we have left? Two. We only have two. That's, by the way, this molecule is called acetyl coenzyme A. We're going to do the same thing with this one, or not we are, the, the cell does. We go uh, and take another carbon dioxide off of this one, and so three minus one makes two, two again. Marvelous. So we get two, two carbon molecules that finally make it into the mitochondrion from the cytoplasm. So remember, too, that glycolysis, glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. This is the mitochondrion. Now, this movement of the pyruvate inward to make the acetyl-CoA takes energy. And so there is a loss of a couple of ATP in this step. And so you get a net of about two ATP in glycolysis. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens. There's a cycle that happens in the liquid part of the mitochondrion, and it's called the Krebs cycle. And in this cycle, what is just beautiful about it is that there is a four carbon molecule, molecule called oxaloacetate. I'm going to abbreviate it as OA. That picks up one of these two carbon fragments and forms a six carbon molecule. And this one will be familiar to you because you've probably heard it before. This is called citric acid in lemons and oranges and things like that, but you've also heard the Krebs cycle called the citric acid cycle. Well, through subsequent steps, this six carbon fragment loses a CO2, now it's down to five, loses another CO2, now it's down to four, and we have now regenerated the original receiving molecule that receives and is ready for the next cycle. That's why we call it a cycle, because at the end we regenerate and we can start over again. Now, some interesting things happen in the Krebs cycle. Two ATPs are formed here. And also, this is interesting, and I've got to go back and kind of pick these up. But in glycolysis, there is another energy molecule, like I told you about in photosynthesis. It's niacin, it's one of the B vitamins. In this step here, from glucose to pyruvate, there are a couple of niacins that are formed. And the way I write those out is 2-NADH. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, niacin. In the step from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, there is another pair generated, two of them. In the Krebs cycle, for each cycle, there are three NADHs formed. So when it goes through two cycles, one for each one of these fragments, you get a total of six. So you get six NADHs. And then there is another B vitamin, riboflavin, you get two riboflavins. Now, I'm not showing you the correct places where these come off. Niacin actually comes, splits off about in about three different locations here. And riboflavin the same. Uh, it'll split off in one place. And it'll just happen in two cycles that we see. Now, here is an important phase. I'm almost done. So hang with me. There is a last step that occurs in the wall of this membrane of the mitochondria. And I call it the electron transport chain. Some people call it the chemiosmotic pump. 
Some people call it oxidative phosphorylation. And those things just kind of describe what's, being hap what's happening. Listen close. In the chemiosmotic pump, hydrogens are pumped across a membrane again, and, it, and when they reach a high concentration, they come right back through an ATPase and they catalyze the formation of ATP. So that's what we're going to see. We're going to see these energy carrying molecules being cashed in for ATPs in this final step. But the thing that's important that we have to track, come back over here with me for just a second. Here's the other player that we haven't accounted for. So let's take oxygen, let's take oxygen all the way over to here. And in the electron transport chain, oxygen, or the chemiosmotic pump, however you want to call it, oxygen is the receiver of those hydrogens that got, that, you know, we formed them there. Now we're picking them up here, we're pumping them here, we're gleaning ATP. Well, if we're pumping hydrogens and we have an oxygen to receive the hydrogens, what do you get when you mix hydrogens and oxygens? H2O. Okay, all right. See, it kind of actually kind of makes sense. So we, over there, we got hydrogen and oxygens from a water, okay? And over in animals, we're using oxygen to get the hydrogens and the oxygens to reform water. That's pretty cool. That's, by the way, that's the whole reason you breathe. Did you realize that it's, when you breathe in oxygen, it's not just to make your lungs fluffy, it's to get oxygen to your cells so that you can make energy. That's the chief thing that happens. That's why you breathe, right there. That's why it's called respiration inside of a cell. Now, let's talk about the cash in, and we truly can be a few minutes away from being done. Help me count these up. We have six plus two plus two. How many NADHs do we have, class? Ten. We've got ten. I'm going to put it up here where there's a good place to see it. For each NADH, we get three ATPs. So what's 10 times 3? 30. We get 30 ATPs here. Okay? We got two riboflavins. I didn't mean to do that. These cash in for two apiece. So what's 2 times 2? Four. 4 ATPs. Okay, how many ATPs did I get from glycolysis? Two. two. And how many did I get from Krebs? Two. two. So I got. I got glycolysis, I got two ATP, and I got from Krebs, I got two ATP. So help me, 30 plus four makes plus two, and two more. Okay, so when I, in an, aer in an aerobic fashion, by using oxygen, break down glucose completely, I get about 38 ATPs per molecule of glucose. So really what I have shown you is called aerobic, aerobic cellular respiration. Now, there is an exception to this rule. What if you go out and you try to run a mile, but you have not run a mile since you were in ninth grade? Then you're gonna be worn out, right? And so what happens is instead of glucose going to pyruvate, but if there's no oxygen down here, your body will make lactate, it's lactic acid, and you'll only get a net of two ATPs. It's called fermentation in animals. In plants, fermentation results in the formation of ethanol, which is alcohol, booze. The good news is the lactic acid that builds up in your muscles it makes you sore for a couple of days, but you don't stay sore forever. Why? Because all of those parts of the lactate, they get filtered through here eventually and you get all the energy out of it and the lactic acid is dissipated and you don't have pain forever. Put a few links together and we're about done. Notice that what plants put out, oxygen and glucose, we use both of those to make our energy molecule ATP, adenosine triphosphate. What happens is ADP, adenosine diphosphate, is phosphorylated. And that's where we get the name oxidative phosphorylation. So some people will call this process down here oxidative phosphorylation. That just describes what happens to the ADP. It just 
adds another phosphate. What's interesting is in ATP, ADP, there is energy in between the phosphate bonds. And when your body wants to, to perform a certain metabolic task, it just snaps these off and gets the energy out of them. It's pretty cool how that works. Now, let's look at the outputs though. Notice that one of the outputs is water. So guess who loves water? Who loves water in class? Plants do, right? Plants love water. And look at some of the other outputs of cellular respiration. CO2, 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 CO2. Who, who uses CO2? Plants do. They use that to make more energy right there. You see that. So we see a beautiful relationship that certainly doesn't look like an accident. It looks like it was designed to work together. It really does. It's a beautiful thing. One last reflection. Water is an output of cellular respiration. And I'm thinking, how do I water a plant? And I started thinking about this and I thought, you know, when I go to the bathroom, I go in the bathroom, that flushes down through somewhere, sewer, some of the, and it, the water eventually winds up being back outside and guess what happens? It evaporates into the air and makes clouds. And so that means that every time it's raining, the bathroom is it's coming back right there. So it's true, I really am watering the plants. <laughs> it's true, it's a real thing. Kind of indirectly, it's not like a direct process. But So that is photosynthesis and that is cellular respiration and that, I think that's what I wanted to do today. Thank you Alicia.